For weeks in December, Charleston City Council member Harry Griffin was under fire for his alleged association with the Proud Boys at an event in downtown Charleston. Today, he gives his side of the story only to me in this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close Ups on Facebook. Councilman Harry Griffin, welcome back to the award-winning Quentin's Close Ups. Thanks for having me, Quentin. I love coming on this show. I've been on this show more than any other program in this city because you're the best journalist in Charleston. I appreciate it greatly, but right now i got to ask you some tough questions. Bring and, them on. Okay. From December 5th to right now, who is Harry Griffin? Quentin, I'm the same guy I've always been. You know, uh, I'm not going to let an instance define a man's existence. That's what I, I've tried to live by over these last this last month. Yes, there were some unfortunate things that happened, uh, but we can't keep dwelling in the past. You know, we have a very important year coming up in 2021. Um, you know, I'm not going to resign. I I've said that over and over again, and I'm here to tell you today that under no circumstances will I resign. In fact, I will run again in 2021 for my seat because um, with everything that's gone on and the push to try to pressure me to leave, um, there's really only one way to know whether or not my district thinks I'm the best representative of them. And that is for my name to be on the ballot in November. And if my district does not want me to be their representative anymore, they will elect somebody else. But if they do, um, they will re-elect me to another four-year term. I know you went from breaking your silence in a letter to most of your constituents to saying, hey, you won't resign and you won't, and at, at first I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you say you probably wouldn't run again. <laughs> and then to say you're running for re-election after all, all while there was criticism of you and people were asking you to step down as you just mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. When did you decide not to run again and when did you decide to run for re-election after all? So, so back in, back in the beginning of last fall, towards the end of summer, um, you know, I was, you know, I wanted to get myself on track mentally, physically. Um, I started my, my diet, which I've lost over 80 pounds in the last five months. Um, and I was very just kind of, I, I thought that I could get to a point at the end of 2021 that I could leave my district in a better place than I found it and I can move on to the next thing in life. Um, however, um, instead what's happened is uh, people have tried to force me out even before the end of my term. And speaking with my other colleagues, my West Ashley colleagues specifically, and looking at what we can do together, I thought that 2021 would be the year that we could get a lot of these projects going, um, especially over in Church Creek. You know, we've got the Church Creek TIF District, right. which is finally generating funds. We've got one of the top Harris Teeters in the whole southeast over right off of Beast Ferry Road. Now we've got shops and and uh, local owned businesses that have come to the area and it's growing and it's going to be great and it's going to generate funding for drainage specifically drainage we've got the church creek stormwater uh, basin authority it's a task force that's that's going to be starting up this year we're having our first meeting next week those are things that um, i thought maybe we could get the ball rolling enough in 2021 that you know i could move on to my next thing uh, and, and my next thing is I certainly don't want to leave uh, politics, but I just, I think that, uh, you know, there's been an issue of whether or not I can be necessarily be effective on this council. Um, you know, we've, I, I've been the lone dissent on a lot of issues. I, I think that my uh, political ideology when it comes to uh, me being a, a very conservative voice um, not, doesn't necessarily fit the agenda of of city hall right now however people have let me know that you know just because our council uh just because I, i'm a, a very small minority on a lot of issues on council doesn't mean that i'm a very small minority in our in our city and i don't know if necessarily our the makeup of our political ideology on council is a good characteristic of what the people of charleston think um, now, all of that to say is I, I'm not including what happened over the last month and all of that. And I think that the truth matters and people deserve to know. And I'll be the say it on the I want to say it right here on your show. I will never, ever support white supremacy. I will never support any hate group. I will never support 
groups that use violence um, to get their message across. Those things I will never support. And you have my word, you have my Citadel word. Um, and the Citadel we were taught, a cadet shall not lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate those who do. I wear my Citadel ring with pride, and I will stand by that honor code. And I'm telling you, face to face, to all your viewers, I do not support white supremacy. I do not support hate groups. Let me ask you, let me go back to obviously the time that you were in December when all that was going on with the criticism of you. During that period, did you ever consider resigning? Never. Not one minute. Okay. Never. Um, you know, there was, that would have been such a terrible thing for me to do to my district for a few reasons. Number one, it would be very selfish. I asked them to put me in office for three over three years ago, and they did. And how could I selfishly resign and put them in a position where they wouldn't have an elected representative for several weeks? All of the hard work that we've done in Church Creek, we could have lost all of that. So there was no way I was ever going to resign. Now, in the meantime, what I've decided to do is I have started reaching out to the uh, people who have called for my resignation, the leaders of these groups that have called for my resignation, and I would like to sit down with them. I'd like to speak with them. I would like to change this narrative. You know, the narrative over the last month has been that nobody can work with me, that I'm an extremist, and it all started because of an event that I, you know, should not, I should have vetted the event a lot more. I should have said no, no thank you early on. I didn't do that. Um, I got wrapped up in the tax increase that we were looking at. It fired me up, and you know I'm a very passionate guy, and when I get when issues come up that I feel are going to hurt our citizens, it bothers me. And I, I couldn't sleep. For weeks I was thinking about this tax raise and, and how we were going to raise taxes during a pandemic and everything else that we've struggled with. I just was so wrapped up in that, um, you know, that I, I'm, I was vulnerable. And, I, and I, I wanted to get that message out. And I didn't really care who heard that message about we don't need to raise taxes. And it made me vulnerable, and, and, and it let me let my guard down. And through all of that, I could have done things a lot better. As a matter of fact, you, let me go to the letter. There's a long letter, so I have to right. break it down for time constraints. But you said this quote, Soon after, I was approached about speaking to a group of people who wanted to march from the United States Customs House to the Charleston City Hall right here. Right. I was told that they were marching due to unfair tax increase. Right. How were you initially approached? They just called me. They called me and said, hey, you know, uh, we're going to do this, this march from Custom House to City Hall. We, are, we don't like the tax raises. We're, we're upset about gentrification. We're upset about uh, uh, filling in wetlands with, with houses. You know, those are the things. You know, they, they basically brought up the ideas that I've been preaching since day one, since I've got on City Council. So when that happened... Um, you know, auto automatically I thought, oh wow, this could be a very, a very, uh, very, uh, you know, moving thing if we did this. Um, but, you know, it evolved into something that I was not supportive of. And like I said, I don't support uh, groups that, that push extreme ideas and I don't support groups that, that have any inclination to use violence as a technique to get their message across. Does the Proud White Boys generally march about unfair tax increase? I have no idea what the Proud Boys <laughs> march about because I don't know anybody in the Proud Boys. I've never been associated with the Proud Boys. That was, uh, you know, basically these 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 local guys that, that have the, you know, one has a blog and the other has a, uh, I guess a, he's got a group or, or whatever. I really... I miss I mischaracterize these guys, uh, you know. At one time, as friends, you know, they they were friends of some of my ideas, but that we're not friends. Um, but unfortunately, that whole Proud Boys thing got kind of attached onto that. I have I have no idea about the Proud Boys. I don't know the Proud Boys. I was not aware that anybody from the Proud Boys was going to go. And it's just easy, I think to just throw that label at me. Oh, he, he supports the Proud Boys. But the truth matters. And the truth is, I don't know those. I don't know the Proud Boys. I don't know anybody that is in, in that group. I don't know anything about that group. That group has nothing to do with me. The friends of the ideas, did that hurt you? Yeah, it hurt me because like I said, I, I was vulnerable. I let my guard down. I was so 
uh, focused on this tax increase because to me this tax increase was not just raising people's property taxes by a few bucks but it was the idea of are we really going to tax our people during the worst pandemic we've ever ever seen during the one of the most intense financial crises we we have ever seen were we really going to tell people that we can reach in your pocket to get that tax increase and we're not willing to cut any spending. That to me was a, a transcendent moment in our government and I was so focused on that that you know I lost a little bit of sense in reality and that I've got to vet every group that asked me to speak to them um, from the get-go. I should have done that. I need to have uh, better awareness to do that. But let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer it. Maybe, maybe more of a rhetorical question. But is that really something to to try to push somebody out of office over? I mean, think about this. And I reached out to Pastor Thomas Dixon because he uh, he he has led the charge for my for me to resign and has continued up until this day to continue to try to push this narrative, uh, which is like I said, very very false. I believe the truth matters. You know, you can push a narrative all you want, but. You, you're trying to destroy my livelihood. You're trying to destroy my credibility. Um, Pastor Dixon, I think, has a, a very, very uh, big group of people that listen to him. And so when he goes out there and he spreads these rumors or, or these, you know, just false statements, you know, he, he's got to realize that it's not just him that, and, and, and a few people. There are people that are listening to him. So I've reached out to him. I called them. Uh, we touch base. I think we're going to talk today. I'd like to sit down with him and talk to him because people are talking at me. They're not talking to me. And there's a big difference. You know, if you've got time to go on social media and spread a narrative, but you don't have time to pick up the phone and call the person that you're talking about, there's a big problem there. And more than that, Pastor Dixon should know about second chances because he's always talked about that. You know, he... He's got a very, very fascinating story and one of second chances that I actually support. I think it's great. You know, he went from, he went to prison and he came back out and he became a pastor and he's become a community activist and he was given a second chance. You know, and at my job, my, my company, all we do is give second chances. We're a second chance company. Over 50% of our employees have, have been to prison. And so I live my life on second chances. And so I'm just wondering why people are so against me having a second chance. And I, and I want that to be the, the thought process for 21 because I'm not going to leave. So let's work together. Let's move forward. Let's quit dwelling on one instance. And let's, let's give me a, a chance to prove my worth. If at the end of 2021, my merits and my decision making and my, my voting record if that doesn't convince my district that I'm, I'm worth to be in the representative, then they will vote me out. And will you be able to sit down and do the meeting in his church? I will do the meeting wherever he wants to have the meeting, anywhere. I, I'm willing to meet with anybody. I, I've always said that. And in fact, that's what shot me in the foot. The, you know, the first event that I ever said no to was this rally down here, the first one ever. And I have always said from my time on council, being a young guy, you know, when I first started, a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, he's inexperienced. He doesn't know a lot of people. What kind of representative is he going to be and that sort of thing? Well, I took that as a challenge to get out and meet as many people as I could. And this was the first event that I've ever said no to. Let me ask you this. What's so divisive about protesting against an unfair tax increase? I don't know if, uh, well, that is not divisive. Unfortunately, when people that show up to an event or people that are rumored to be in an event that associate themselves with extremist ideas. It doesn't, it's not necessarily that, that they were there for a tax increase or that they were, there was a, a fight to, against a tax increase. Some of the ideas that were presented are good. You know, uh, tax increase, gentrification, uh, um, you know, the, the uh, filling in of wetlands and all those other things that actually are, are policy ideas that we have tackled on council over the last few years. It's not those ideas that people are upset about. Rightfully so, people are upset when people show up that want to push extremist ideas or push the use of violence. 
um, or militaristic. I, I think I saw a picture that somebody was driving a tank down here. That just isn't right. And I completely understand why people would not want to be associated with things like that. But let's also remember that we have had uh, bad behavior from people that have been protesting and counter-protesting at times. In fact, I know somebody threw some, some slurs at you while you were down there covering the, the event the reporting. Right. So it's not right from either side. We've got to try to get away from the extreme and get back towards coming together and working together. That's the only way that we're going to move forward. One idea that I am, I'm working on, and this is hopefully going to be my big idea of 2021. I've been talking about this for the last few months. I want to start um, a, a summit, the, the Charleston Youth Summit. Um, and I want to do it in, in the second half, maybe towards the end of 21. I want to get public speakers from around the country to come to Charleston. And I want to invite young people in this to come to our city and we find ways for young people to work together. Yeah, I, unfortunately, my battery's running out, so let me jump into a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, what local issues have to do with the, the group, the Proud White Boys, in your mind? I have no idea. That I, I really have no idea. I don't know anything about any associations with the Proud Boys. That's the honest-to-God truth. Okay, you said this quote in the letter. However, as I heard more about the event, I noticed that the unauthorized use of my picture was being used on a fly of that event. Who owns the copyright to your photo? Well, it's on the city website, so anybody can go on there and get it. Did you encourage the photographer of your photo to pursue legal action against the group? I did contact my attorney about about the entire situation, um, and especially the recording without my consent of that phone call. You said this quote, I also noticed that the Dean of the event had changed significantly. From the time you spoke with the group to the time you heard about the change in Dean, what was that timeline like? Uh, a couple of weeks, maybe maybe three or four weeks. Uh, I think it was maybe middle of November, the first time they brought it up to me, and I didn't hear anything for a while. And then as it got closer, they kind of gave me some more ideas of what they were pushing. And I just didn't think that some of the other ideas were good. What were those other ideas that they were pushing? Well, they were. there was, you know, number one, I've never ever called for Mayor John Tecklenburg's resignation, ever. I've never signed any petitions for him to resign. I've never asked him in city council to resign. That was on there. I don't support that. He was just reelected, uh, and as long as he obeys the laws, and the only person that can remove him is the governor. So I don't support that. And there was a lot of discussion in that article or in that, that thing about uh, the Racial Conciliation Commission, and I, I just... I served on that commission. I, I, was, I was let go by Council Members Gregory and Sacker and the mayor. In second. But, but I served on that. And how on earth was I going to sit up there and support this group when, you know, they were against that that racial conciliation uh, commission as well? You said this quote. So I decided not to speak with the organizers again. How many times in total did you speak with them? Maybe two or three. You also said this too, I allowed my energy to be used by others for their negative and selfish purposes, and for that I apologize. But Councilman, how is that an apology? Well, my apology is that, you know, my intentions were good and that I wanted to protect our citizens from taxes, but I, like I said, like I've said in this interview, I let my guard down. I didn't vet the group personally, uh, you know, did not vet that group enough, and I'm very sorry for that. I'm sorry that, that if that it negatively impacted people. You said that you allowed your energy to be used by others. What type of energy did you actually use? Well, I was so energetic about the tax increase and I, ha I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. And so when a group came to me saying, oh, well, we want to march about the tax increase, you know, that, uh, that ultimately, I th they used my picture and said that I was going to come speak and, and I think they were trying to generate more people to come join their, their cause by doing that. Do you apologize for aligning yourself by default with this group? By I don't default. align myself with this group, but I do apologize that people may think that, and I apologize to any person who thinks that I support white supremacy because that's an all-out lie, and I will never, ever support uh, or, or condone, or I will never support white supremacy, period. You also wrote that using words such as, quote, a good person or friend, as you mentioned earlier, created hostile feelings when viewed by members of the community. Why didn't you explain why those words may have caused the problem? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm a very outgoing person and I call everybody friend or buddy or, you know, that's just how I talk. Um, and especially when 
people call me on the phone and that sort of thing but I'm a public official and I've got to do a better job of of not only obviously how I use my language which you know I use some bad language and I'm very apologetic for that um, but um, you know I don't I don't condone that language that I use that was bad language and, and I'm hoping that me and my colleagues can move on from that but Go ahead. As a matter of fact, in, the, in that call, you allegedly said that this about your colleagues in council. You said this, school. there's times in my life, there's time in my political career where I had to bite my tongue a little bit. You know, I have to do it in every meeting. You know, I want to tell some of those guys that they're explicit suckers and that I explicitly hate them. And I wish that I could see them out in the street. Is this the type of behavior that the Proud Boys allegedly displayed? I, I don't think that had anything to do with the Proud Boys at all. I was just expressing uh, at the time, you know, obviously some, uh, some. Uh, I was obviously fired up and I used some terrible language and I, I don't think any of my colleagues or any of the language that I used, uh, I, you know, I, I went to council the very next meeting after that came out talk to my colleagues and I hope that we can move forward in 2021 together. But do you consider your alleged voice the one voice of sanity? Uh, yeah, I think everybody uses bad language a time or two. I don't think anybody expects that their conversations are being recorded without their knowledge. Um, that's, a, that's a big problem. Um, but you know, I'm going to try to take the approach that I should pretend like my grandmother's listening to all my conversations. Do you think you can represent West Ashley effectively after this alleged phone call? I absolutely do. Yes, I do. I think that when if there's an issue on the table that's going to make West Ashley better, I, 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 I know that my colleagues would not vote against it due to uh, a leaked phone call. Do you think the other council members will be open to working with you going forth? Absolutely I do, and in fact many of them have reached out to me and our relationships are not harmed at all. Um, we're going to have a good year in 2021, a year of action, and uh, I look forward to working with every one of my colleagues. Uh, as you just mentioned earlier, you were later removed from the City's Commission of Equity, Inclusion, and Racial Conciliation after uh, Dudley and uh, Sackman said right. that they needed to complete their work without further distraction. Why did you need to be there in the first place? Uh, I was asked to be there by the mayor, and I and I accepted. So that's why I was on there. What were those further distractions? Well, obviously, uh, the media was was still going on about the the phone conversations and my alleged uh, input in, in the event, which was really none. Um, so, in order to just, uh, it was it was just much easier for me to step away, and uh, I wasn't going to resign. But I. I when they when they asked if I you know for me to be removed I, I accepted so I know Tecklenburg called their action a good decision when did you find out that Dudley and Sackman had gone to the mayor to have you removed from the commission they didn't they they, they contacted me first Dudley Gregory did Jason Sackman did not uh, William Dudley Gregory uh, who I have a ton of respect for he reached out to me we had a conversation mayor never actually talked to me about it um, he he in fact when the press release came out you know, he is the, the person who's supposed to remove people from commissions, not other council members. Um, but because I understood the, the, the entire situation and I had spoken significantly with council member Gregory, uh, I, I, there was no way that I was going to argue with that. What else did you learn about that decision? Which one in particular? All of Being it? Being removed from the commission. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, uh, disagree with their decision nobody wants a distraction they've got important work that needs to be done um, you know I, I learned that that the mayor uh, you know I wish he would have handled it a little bit better you know it should have come from him he's the mayor um, I feel like he put council members Gregory and Sakran in a tough situation um, but you know council member Sakran has called for my resignation he's been all over the news uh, the last few weeks I just hope that uh, him and I can get back into the chambers, well, virtually, I should say, and uh, and get the work of the people done. Um, Do you forgive him? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I've, I, I don't feel like I need to forgive him, you know. He, he didn't do anything wrong. He's a city council person. His district, he says, asked him to push for that, and he did what they asked him to do. Did they push for him to sign the petition to remove you from office? I don't know that, but I, I would never sign a petition or remove any of my colleagues from office. But then again, I, you know, whenever 
you know that that leaked conversation came out I can understand it would it would upset some people um, now uh, did you, anyone else in the commission agree with Dudley and Sackman's decision and the mayor's decision to remove you from this commission oh yeah absolutely okay uh, let me ask you this did Sackman and ja uh, Councilwoman Jackson sign the position before or after you were removed from the commission I believe they signed it after how do you work with those two after they signed this petition because just the same way that I want them to work with me after they heard a conversation that didn't paint them in a good light or paint any of us in a good light. We just have to get past it. We can't keep dwelling on the past. You know, we have to push forward together. We can't let one month or, or a couple weeks or, or, or one phone conversation and one day, you know, tear up all of the good work that we've done. And we can't let it keep us from doing more good work. Now, I know that you ended up not speaking, but some in the community say your alleged participation in the lead-up to the event, including the online video call that you allegedly had right. uh, with the event organizers, raised red flags after you allegedly called the organizers friends and good people. What do they call you now? They hate me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I haven't talked to those guys since. And, uh, you know, my problem is I'm a public official, so, you know, when people have conversations with me and I use words like friend, buddy, you know, whatever, you know, it means something. And, you know, I have to, I have to be a little bit more um, smart about the kind of terminology I use when I talk to people. You said this too, uh, it's probably not in an alleged phone call, it's probably not in my best interest to come out there for this one, meaning this event, but I do not want to change anything about your document at all. What was that document, sir? Well, it was, uh, you know, kind of kind of like a airing of grievances or something like that, an old English terminology or whatever, but I told them, don't change your document, you know, it's freedom of speech, if you believe that then you should go with it. Why, why would I, I've told, told those guys, I'm not coming, you know, but that shouldn't take away from your event. You have the right to peacefully protest. But at that time, you know, I didn't know anything about the Proud Boys or anything like that. Um, it was just an unfortunate circumstance, and I really hope that this year we can move on from it. You allegedly told the event organizers to lie to participants and to say you can't make it because of work and, quote, no one will pry. But then they did pry on us, so what now? Look, I may, I, I shouldn't have done that, you know, um, you know, I just, I made a mistake, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can move on from it, you know, I did work that day, I did a lot of things that day, I was at Frankie's Fun Park with my, my uh, City of Charleston youth football team that I coached, um, I was only, even if I could have gone to the event, it would have been for only a matter of minutes, I told them that up front. Um, which, but it would have been a bad look if I would have been there. It was a bad look that I was on the poster. It was a bad look that I was involved, period. Now, when did you schedule the trips to Frankie's Front Park and obviously eating with your, uh, your grandmother? Well, I eat with her every single Saturday. I've always done that. Um, and the Frankie's Fun Park, we planned that back in August. Okay. So when the season started, we planned that. So those were always going to happen. It was never a cover-up or anything like that. People say all the time that words matter, Mr. Councilman. What do your words in this letter show about you? Well, we're basically that, that I, I, I am a young person who is still learning every single day. Um, I'm a passionate person. I am always going to put our city first. Um, unfortunately, I got wrapped up in something that I'm not proud of, but I'm not going to let this, uh, this moment um, be the testament of me for, the, for, for my life. You know, I am going to use it as a learning tool, and I would ask that everybody in this city, you know, gives me the opportunity over this next year to prove uh, who I am, what I stand for, um, and at the end of the day, you know, I'm going to turn turn this narrative from a negative into a positive. Mr. Councilman, were you sorry that you got caught? No, because I I, I was leaving. I, I, I decided not to go before. You know, if I had gone, you know, then this would be a, a much more intense conversation. You know, but to me, I made the right decision ultimately by not to attend. It just so happened that the people that were planning this event decided to record my conversation without my knowledge. What they were going to use it for, who knows? Did you play footsie with these folks? Look, like I've said, and, and you, you're asking all the right questions, uh, it, yes, I entertained them because I thought it was about taxes. But 
in the grand scheme of things, if you if you if you want the real, real truth, and like I've said before, and I'll say it to you again, I had no idea any alignment with the Proud Boys was coming. I, I don't I don't even know anybody in the Proud Boys. I don't support white supremacy, and anybody who says that any of those things are true, that's just a, a lie. I'll never ever support those groups. Mr. Councilman, let me ask you this. Isn't this recent event with you and the alleged event organizers, isn't this kind of like what happened with you when you helped draft this, the slavery resolution and then you voted against it? No, it isn't. Because I, I was on the committee to draft the resolution. Councilman Gregory asked me to do that, be on that with him. I wanted to use the word denounce. I thought that was a much better word than apology. I didn't think that our citizens in Charleston would be able to necessarily get behind an apology on behalf of us uh, being so far uh, removed from slavery. And I also wanted to see more action steps. Now ultimately um, that, um, that resolution to apologize has led to some really great things including the commission. Um, but that, it's taken a couple of years to get that off the ground. I was hoping that we could address some of our disparities in the African American community, such as affordable housing, such as flooding in, in areas like UG Street. Um, I was hoping we could address those in that document. Um, but to me, it was it was very symbolic, and, and I wanted the word denounce to be that word that was used. Ultimately, it was used somewhat, but apology, everybody just kept saying apology, apology, apology. A lot of people, they get tired of hearing apology all the time. You know, an apology doesn't mean anything if there's not a plan of action, which is why I'm trying not to sit up here and say I'm sorry over and over again. I'm telling you that my actions will show that I am better than the situation that we just dealt with and that I dealt with. When you look back to December to right now, once again, what is the biggest difference? Well, obviously, a lot has changed. Um, you know, the, you know, I've lost some friends. I've lost some well people that I thought were friends. You know, there are people that have made decisions about what they think of me, but based on what they've heard from the media. You know, I have been uh, very a lot more selective about who I'm talking to. Uh, I've been a lot more selective about who I do interviews with. You're the only the third interview that I've done in the last month. I did an interview with Chef Dwayne Pierce, right. who is uh, somebody that I have a lot of respect for. He's got a new platform, a new cooking show that he's doing where he does roundtable discussions. I did an interview with Bill Davis from West of, right. and I'm doing this interview with you. You're the only three that I, that I felt like value the truth over the narrative. As of this week, Mr. Councilman, there are more, over 36,000 signatures asking you to resign. You say you would not, obviously. Right. What do those 36,500 signatures tell you about you? Well, listen, that petition's on change.org, and anybody in the world can sign it. I haven't seen a list of people. I'd love to see the list. I'd love to see how many people live in the city of Charleston, and I'd love to see how many people live in District 10. I have a feeling it's quite a low number. Where do we go from here? We get back into the chambers on Tuesday night, well virtually, I right. keep saying back in the chambers. We get back to the people's work. We look at Church Creek, we look at Charleston, we look at uh, all of the many things that we can continue to work on. We look at affordable housing, you know, we look at how we're going to recover from this pandemic. There's a lot of great work that needs to be done. This was obviously a distraction, um, but I'm ready to get back to work with my colleagues come Tuesday. Councilman Harry Griffin, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to the award-winning Quintin's Close-Ups. I'm always uh, happy to come sit in your hot seat. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.